the Spirit, one God, amen. Today's the third Sunday of the Blessed Month of Abib. And this month we've been focusing on the apostles, the commission of the apostles, the virtues of the apostles. Now we see the service of the apostles. Our Lord says, you give them something to eat. This is a very familiar reading for us. The story of our Lord Jesus Christ feeding the great multitudes is one that we've heard often. And, and sometimes I think we might take it for granted. We, we might say, it just no longer surprises us. We know the punchline. We know what's happening in this gospel passage. Maybe it has nothing to say to us anymore. Sometimes we find ourselves feeling this way, almost bored with the story. So we need to force ourselves to go deeper and to seek the hidden treasure that's so often right in front of our faces. What kind of man was this that Jesus, who had 5,000 men that would follow him as he walked around from town to town? 5,000. That doesn't even count the women and children that would have been following him. So we can guess maybe there was 10,000, 15,000. One can only imagine the lines, the crowds, the, the people pushing, readjusting, just to get a glimpse of the Savior. People waited for their friends. They waited with their families. They couldn't even hear. They didn't have megaphones. They didn't have microphones. It was far. 5,000, right? 10,000 maybe, 20,000 people. If you can imagine that number. He was so far away. And at the end of a very warm day out in the sun, miles of walking, <clears throat> waiting with crying children, the moaning of the sick, the people would have been exhausted. And the, people's, the, the disciples sensed this. And they come to Christ and tell him, you know, we should dismiss the crowd. They should find a place to eat and to sleep. And I think that was a reasonable request, a reasonable suggestion by all accounts. Except for Christ. Time and time again, <clears throat> we see our Lord thinking on a level that we never even knew existed. And if we think about it, it makes complete sense. It's, it's a crazy idea to think that people who had waited hours and days for physical healing and the words of life would have to leave the Lord because of something as simple as bread. So when we are sitting at the feet of the Son of God, you don't worry about where your next meal will come from. That's one of the lessons. So we take a look at this, at this miracle. Th there's no doubt about it. This is an amazing miracle. This was not seen as a small thing, but this is a great miracle that happens. The Son of God took something as simple as a few loaves of bread, and he multiplied them for the benefit of everyone. And he still uses bread to work miracles today. Every Sunday, every time the Orthodox gather in a liturgy, we witness a miraculous transformation of bread and wine into the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ himself, who is the bread of life. This is what the apostles learned. This is what was taught to us thousands of years ago. We who are hungry and feel so much emptiness are invited to see things differently. We're busy. We're busy with life, we're tired, we're weak. And that is not the right time to think about leaving the presence of God. When we're in that state, oftentimes it's tempting. That is not the right time to depart from the community of Christians. When we're tired and we're sick and we're hungry, if I gave you the opportunity to be present for this miracle, I think we would all jump for joy. If we had a time machine and we can go back and see this miracle firsthand and actually taste the bread from the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ, we would jump for joy. 
I think, I hope, you would get to see our Lord Jesus Christ. You would hear his words. You would share the bread that he blessed. Now, I invite you to jump for joy. You come every Sunday or every chance you can go to a liturgy. You come, you hear the words of our Lord Jesus Christ. We pray together as a church, which is the body of Christ. And you do one better. You eat the blessed bread. You partake from the bread of life. The Lord himself, who invites us to eat with him and to be filled by him. The Lord Christ did not merely have compassion on those travelers in this gospel path. On this gospel passage. He has compassion on us. The church does not exist to create feelings of guilt or resentment. The church is a sign of the compassion and love of Christ that has that he has for all his people. And so the church is a place where we are recharged, where we are renewed to continue this long, hard road with our Lord Jesus Christ. When the priest asks where you've been, he, he doesn't really, he's not really interested in your social life. He isn't looking to make you feel bad. The priest is wondering why you are traveling alone, why you are without food for the journey. It's unwise to travel alone without the proper supplies. And it's even more unwise when we're already exhausted. We thank God that we are still part of this amazing story. Christ is already here. Our souls will be filled and refreshed. And we come and we invite others to, to meet the Lord and to share in this meal. There's another aspect that I want to reflect on. The gospel passage from Luke chapter 9 verses 10 through 17 We see that our Lord doesn't need much. He doesn't need much to, in order to accomplish his will. But there is one thing that he requires, is that we entrust everything to him. We don't hold back. Sometimes we feel like when we're called to the service, whatever service that may be, not only Sunday school, but any service, you feel like, you know what, Abuna, I need to be at a spiritual level, number 10, before I'm able to serve in whatever capacity that you have. He doesn't need much. As our Lord seeks to feed the hungry and the tired people, the disciples look at this meager supply of food, the loaves and the fish. And he says, you know what, we only have five loaves and two fish here. And how does our Lord respond? He says, Bring them to me. We bring our small offering to the feet of Christ and we trust him to multiply that offering. The worst thing in the world is to be distracted or to set your gaze on anything else. Instead, we are called to bring our focus and everything else to God. Bring everything to God, ourselves, our senses, our minds, our service, our worship, our lives. That is the meaning and the purpose of the Christian life. He doesn't need us to be saints before he can use us. This is the point. He doesn't wait for us to have a multitude of gifts and talents before we become useful. I'm a clear example of that. No matter who we are, no matter your age, no matter your size, no matter your strength, no matter your strength or your weaknesses, God can use you in ways that you could never imagine. God can take your meager offering, your talents, your gifts, your resources, and if you lay them honestly at the feet of Christ, humbly, at his service, he can multiply them in a miraculous way. Didn't he do this with the disciples? He says, bring them here to me. But we only have five loaves and two fish. They're right. 
they only had five loaves and two fish. But they made a very big mistake. And the Lord replied with a very clear answer. It's not just the answer to this particular problem, but the answer to every problem that seems completely impossible. Bring them to me. That was the answer. Bring your problem to me. It's as if our Lord is saying, in your hands, yeah, there are five loaves and two fish. In my hands, it's a feast. The fact of the matter is that when we, if we believe that we are limited in everything that we do, we're right. It's called the self-defeating prophecy. And it's a problem. We limit ourselves because we don't believe that God is God. Because we don't actually think that he is watching over us, that he loves us, and that he wants the best for us. Is it because we're afraid to give him control in our lives? So let us not be faithless. Let us be people of faith. The loaves and the fish, which are in the disciples' hands, they couldn't feed a small family. They became in the hands of the master a feast that would feed thousands, 15,000, 20,000 people and provided 12 baskets of leftover. No doubt that the number 12 has no coincidence. It's assigned to the disciples who were 12 in number. <clears throat> they had worried about how to feed the masses and now each one of these had a basket full of his own leftovers. The Christian's faith is not seeing is believing. Our faith is believing is seeing. Tasting the gifts of God and choosing to follow him and seeing the results. Each one of us has things that we would like to do and to accomplish that we are very limited in our talents and our abilities. But Christ gives us a way to multiply what's good in each one of us. Bring those gifts, bring those talents, even those weaknesses, bring to him. Even our best talents are scraps in our hands, but they're made wonderful in his hands. Where do we start? We start in prayer. Lord, I'm simple. I'm a simple person. I have very little to offer. I have very little to offer to anyone. I can barely take care of myself. But I offer you my life. I ask you to bless this simple offering for the glory of your name. God can't ignore this prayer. If it's said with your whole heart because God loves humble prayers. We see an example of this with Moses who stuttered. Yet he was chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. And once his life was offered up to God, there was really not much that he couldn't do. He became a blessing to his family. He became a blessing to all the people of Israel. We are given a choice every single day. We can choose to let faith or the lack of faith dictate our lives. We can choose to be known by our strengths and weaknesses, or we can choose to be known by the one whom we serve. Our Lord Jesus Christ has done and will continue to do miracles in our church and our lives. And when he does this, we must first put everything in its rightful place into his loving hands. There's another aspect to this. He meets our needs. It's also important to notice that in this case, when he miraculously met their needs, they were needs. They were needs. They were actual needs. There's another place in the Gospels where his apostles were walking with him and they were talking with him and they had been learning from him and they were hungry. And he did not perform a miracle. 
He performed no miracle because there was grain right there. So they were hungry and they went and started picking the grains of wheat off the plants and started eating the kernels of grain right there. Mark, this is in Matthew chapter 12, verse 1, and Mark chapter 2, verse 23. We know this story, hopefully. The people out here in the wilderness are not people who had a restaurant nearby. They didn't have refrigerators. They didn't have pantries that are full, like me. They're not near fields where it can be harvested at the time, or they can glean uh, wheats of uh, grain, what's left that the harvesters have, have left. No, they were truly in a state of need. In many cases, we pray to God to miraculously supply our needs when in truth we're just asking God to enable our laziness. I know I do. We're hungry, not because there's no food, but because we don't want to go through the harvest, the effort of harvesting. We have nothing to harvest because we did not go through the effort of planting. We didn't plant because we did not go through the effort of plowing. When the food was right there, right at their hands, our Lord did not call down bread from heaven. He told his apostles, go pick the grain. But when there's a true need, when you are truly doing all that he asks you to do, when you are truly seeking the kingdom of heaven, and because of his command, not because of our laziness, not because of our foolishness, but because of his command, you're out in the wilderness. And having heard his word for three days, you look around and there's nothing for you to eat. There's no food for you to harvest. You're going hungry. When you truly are following him and you truly find yourself in need, he will meet your need. Regardless of our of our shortcomings, he alone can multiply grace and spiritual blessings and the peace and joy that comes with them. What's asked of us in return? Simply that we obey and that we sit in his presence. Are we being honest about this? We simply obey and sit in his presence. Only bring your small offering and obey his voice. Sit at his feet and be patient. Be patient. So, uh, the, the psalmist David writes, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. May he also hear our cries and multiply whatever we have to the glory of his name. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Blessed are